but emotion is not only the feeling leading up to when you believed on Jesus Christ, but even the emotion you have after you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people will say, well, do I really believe? Because if I believe, you know, why am I so depressed? You know, why do I not have peace? You know, why am I so angry all the time? Why am I impatient? Why am I worried? Why am I anxious? Uh, let's look at a couple of verses there. Proverbs 28. 26 it says he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool but whoso walketh wisely he shall be delivered uh, Jeremiah 17 we'll just read from verse 5 thus saith the Lord cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord and we just skip a couple of verses go down to verse 9 which is a very famous verse the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So it's hard to determine what your heart is going to do. So why would you determine whether or not you, your faith exists based on what your heart feels? Because your heart not only can deceive you, it's hard to know what your heart is thinking. And the Bible is saying if you trust in your heart, you're a fool. So it's, it's not a good way to determine whether or not you have faith, what your heart is feeling. And in fact, if we go to Philippians 4, I wanted to show you this verse here. Philippians 4, 4 verse 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So be careful. So full of care, being worried or anxious. He's saying, don't be a worrier fool about this. Don't be careful about it. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So your heart is not a good factor to determine something absolute like the existence of your faith because your heart can waver. It can deceive you. It's hard to know your heart. It's, a, it's foolish to trust in your heart. And that is why your heart needs to be kept in check. And we're given a few points here that, you know, we pray to God, we let our requests be made known unto God, and then the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep our hearts and then what we think on, we need to think on positive things because that will keep our hearts and our minds right and on the right path. So our heart actually needs to be kept in check. Our heart is not going to determine things for us. Our heart needs to be uh, subdued and, and controlled in a sense to make sure that we, uh, believe or we feel the right way. Now, how you respond emotionally can depend on a couple of things. And this is another reason why it's foolish to determine whether or not you have faith based on emotion because emotion can be swayed by several factors. And one thing is I want to show you here in Romans 7 is your emotion can be swayed on the depth of your knowledge. It can be, it can be swayed on how much you know things. What does it say here in Romans 7 verse 7? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, that the law had said, "Thou shalt not covet." But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death, for sin taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. So Paul is saying here that he didn't know whether he was sinning until the commandment came, because he didn't know that lust was a sin unless the commandment said, thou shalt not lust. And the principle I'm trying to get from this verse here is you don't know that you're doing wrong unless you understand that you're doing wrong. So it's the same with sorrow and conviction. Maybe you're not sorrowful or, con or, or don't have that feeling of guilt because you don't even know what you're doing is wrong. So sorrow and guilt can be a result 
of your knowledge about what is right and wrong. It may not be, it, it isn't whether or not your faith exists or not. Uh, let's look at another passage here in uh, Luke 7.36. And I won't read all of it for sake of time, but, um, you know, this, uh, Jesus is sitting at meat in a Pharisee's house called Simon, and then we know a woman comes and basically uh, cries uh, and, and cries on his feet and wipes the tears uh, of her eyes off his feet with her hair. Now, let's read from verse 39. When, now, when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a creditor, certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will, he, will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came, since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loveth little. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So he's saying here the reason why she's responding with such sorrow is because she realizes how sinful a person she is. Because, you know, maybe Simon the Pharisee didn't actually have less sins. I mean, maybe because Jesus is saying, you know, your sins are, his sins are little. But what I'm trying to say here is, if you don't think you have a lot of sins, you're not going to have much sorrow or conviction. Does that mean you can't believe on Jesus Christ, acknowledging the sins that you realize that you have? No, because sorrow and conviction grow as you realize the extent of your sinfulness. Because, you know, and that's why people that say that they are sorrowful and they have this conviction, it's not that they they believe and the people that don't have sorrow and conviction don't believe. It's just that they understand the law of God. Like Paul said, they understand what God expects of them and they realize how far they come short. But if somebody doesn't have that full understanding of what God's uh, requirement is in order to work your way to heaven, do they truly understand how, how sinful they are and will they have the same amount of sorrow and conviction as somebody that does have that understanding. So, you know, this sorrow and conviction, it can depend on your circumstances. Because maybe if you come from a lifestyle of sin like this woman did, and we don't know what it was, probably she was a prostitute, I think. She was probably a harlot. And that's why the Pharisee is saying, you know, she's sleeping around with all these guys. She's unclean. That's why you wouldn't want her touching you. Um, so maybe she was a prostitute. Maybe she had done a lot of sins. She was really regretting it. She realized that, you know, fornicating for a living was a really grievous sin. And this is why she had a lot of sorrow and conviction. But maybe the sins that Simon the Pharisee was com committing uh, were not as great as the woman's. And that's why he didn't have the same sorrow or conviction as this lady did. So, so these uh, circumstances in your life can change whether or not you believe. But, you know, generally the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's good news. So generally people will have a good response. I mean, generally when you believe on Jesus Christ, you're going to feel happy about it because it's good news. Some people are going to feel happier than others, but you don't determine the existence of whether or not you believe the gospel on how you feel after you receive the gospel because it doesn't change whether or not you've believed. It's relative to each person. And again, emotions are arbitrary because how good do you need to feel after you were saved to know that you actually believed? And how long do you have to feel good to, to know that you were saved? Because, you know, what if you didn't feel good shortly thereafter? Would you then question whether or not your faith is there? No, because it doesn't change whether or not um, you have faith. And I'm not going to go too in depth into this point because I want to get to my next point. But, you know, you can feel good without faith. So, 
doesn't that just prove that it's a, it's a bad way of determining whether or not you have faith? The fact that you can feel really, really bad, uh, oh sorry, you can feel really, really good without faith just shows that it has nothing to do with faith. I mean, how many times do we read in the Bible? I'm not going to turn there, but if Hebrews 11, it talks about, you know, enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. You know, sin brings you great pleasure. And that's why, you know, in Job 21, it talks about the pleasures of the wicked, how their bull gendereth, their children run to and fro and are happy. Hey, they're having a great time. Um, Psalm 73, you can read these later, it talks about the prosperity of the wicked. You know, they don't have trouble like the psalmist has when he's going through Psalm 73. We talk, we see in James 5, where it talks about the condemnation of the rich. You know, they have these pleasures. They live without wantonness, right? Without wanting things. And God doesn't resist them. So God's not giving them any trouble to remind them that they shouldn't have their, their eyes on this world. They should have their eyes on eternal things. Because one day they are going to descend into hell and, and perish for all eternity suffer for all eternity if they do not realize that they need a savior and believe on jesus christ so you can feel very good without having faith on the lord jesus christ so it's a bad example but not only that even with faith on jesus christ the opposite you can feel really bad so because even if you have faith you can feel really bad how you feel is not a good determination of whether or not you have faith because as a believer you can have very very bad feelings and I won't turn to all the verses, but, you know, we have John 14, the Holy Ghost. What is he called? The Comforter. Now, why would we need a Comforter if we felt good all the time? And, you know, there was nothing to be comforted by. You know, in 2 Corinthians, you know, um, Paul talks about being comforted in all their tribulation. So we're comforted in our tribulation. Um, even when he was sending Epaphroditus to the Philippians, he said he didn't want to have sorrow upon sorrow. So sorrow is possible as a believer. So it's foolish to say, well, I don't have faith because why would I be so sorrowful? Why do I not have this joy, like the joy of the spirit that uh, I should have as a child of God? Well, you know, not necessarily because you can have sorrow and we're comforted in sorrow. You know, Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, if rejoicing was automatic, if you believed on Jesus Christ and you're just head over heels, you're always rejoicing. And, you know, one, you know people say, oh, once I got saved, I was just so fulfilled with joy and I used to be sorrowful. I mean, that, that's a terrible way to determine whether or not you have faith because if rejoicing in the Lord was automatic, why would it need to be commanded? Why would God say, you know, rejoice in the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice. Is if you believed on Jesus Christ, it was automatic. Well, it's not automatic. That's why we're commanded to rejoice in the Lord. Uh, 